Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Tim Weirman. Uh, I have a company out of Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philadelphia. And the company's name is uh, Nutrition Education Services. Developed the uh, educational program called Eat to Compete over 20 years ago. And I've had the privilege of speaking at hundreds of colleges to thousands of student athletes and coaches around the country from Alaska to Florida to Maine to Southern California, you name it. I've been to all different parts of the country and it's been a, a real pr privilege over those years to meet with so many student athletes. My first visit to your campus, so thank you for having me. I appreciate you coming out this morning. Uh, beautiful campus, really it's a beautiful campus and I, I get to see it without all the snow so it's even, uh, I think, even a, a, better, uh, a better view. Uh, so when coming onto a campus, my goals are pretty much three, are to share information, content on sports nutrition from the educational material that uh, I've developed over the years, to share that information with you uh, on the 18 to compete topics. And a second goal is to hear your questions, very importantly. This is an opportunity for you as student athletes in all different sports and activities to fire away questions you might have regarding your particular needs, anything that comes to mind, this is your opportunity. A relatively smaller group, I often speak to four, 500, 600 student athletes in one auditorium, doesn't always allow for a lot of engagement. So I, I welcome this type of setting. So this is your opportunity at any time, just put your hand up and if I can answer your question, I certainly will. And if I don't have the answer for you, I will do, make every effort to get that answer for you at a later time. So please feel free to ask questions. And my third goal is to not just walk out of here today sharing information with you, you never seeing me again, but rather leaving behind resources that you can access uh, throughout the year. The Eat to Compete manual, I've had this around for many, many, many years. Uh, I know folks don't make copies much anymore, but there's still some that like to look at a book and touch the book and, and read the book. So I will be leaving behind this manual in the, your athletic um, department. It does give the licensing to photocopy, distribute, okay? So it's a wealth of information. I have this in about 800 colleges. But for those that like to go electronically, you can have access to your own copy online, all right? So I have a web portal, the Eat to Compete web portal, which is nothing but information. And it's the 18 topics. It's my presentation, it's my slides, your own e-copy of the manual, weekly nutrition tips. You have access to that information at no cost to you for the next 12 months, okay? So you will receive an email through, probably through your coaches over the next week showing you how to sign up. It's three, three simple steps. So uh, it's not really time consuming. You can use as much or as little as you like. It's entirely up to you. So uh, those are the resources we leave behind because again, I think it's important to build upon what you might learn today. You can't absorb everything in one afternoon uh, or one morning. Uh, you can't accumulate all this information and process it all, but rather it's a building process. So I encourage you to get a hold of that information uh, at some point in time throughout the year, okay? Again, a wealth of information. My background, not just as an educator, but as an old athlete in my earlier days uh, playing soccer, so I know what it's like to spend 90 minutes on the soccer field as a midfielder, played uh, plenty of basketball over the years, have done 75, 80 triathlons, I've done the sprint distance, the half Ironman, I've done the full Ironman. In fact, I did Ironman USA up in Lake Placid uh, about a dozen years ago. So I've shared a lot of the type of training that you guys do from one day and one week and one month to the next. I understand how demanding your sports can be. I also recognize how important the nutrition plays in terms of the outcome of not just one given day, but your entire week of training and competition, your entire season. And I ask you to sort of when you're looking at your diet and you're trying to make improvements and changes, acquire the knowledge to do it the right way, number one, but two, be patient. There are no quick fixes. So the little things that you change over a given day or week, over time, they make a difference, whether it's simply doing a better job with your hydration, whether it's simply getting out of bed in the morning and having a three, four, 500 calorie breakfast, something you haven't done in the past. Those little changes accumulate over weeks and months and they do make a difference. So on that note, again, just some of the places I've been to over the years, uh, different schools and so forth, spoken at a lot of the coaches' co uh, conventions over the years as well. Some of the resources that I already mentioned and the 18 Need to Compete topics. We got an hour together. We can't cover all 18 topics, but you can certainly drive the discussion to a lot of the different topics. But 
What I do like to share with the student athletes on my first visits to campus are topics one through four. What I refer to as the fundamentals of sports nutrition. Getting athletes to recognize how much fuel they need as a male versus a female, uh, field hockey versus cross country versus football or ice hockey, whatever sport or activity you're involved in. Uh, you need to understand what your fuel requirements are. If your goal at any given time throughout the year is to simply maintain a good healthy body weight or promote a weight loss or a little bit of weight gain, you gotta first understand how much fuel you're consuming now that's keeping you at your present body weight and then build from there. So we'll talk about that in topic one. Also the types of fuel, there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of trends, and I've seen them. In 23 years of doing this, I've seen the, you know, the, the low carb, the high protein, the low fat, the high carb. It's overwhelming. The fact of the matter is we need all three of those energy nutrients at every meal. So we'll talk about the right types of fuel to be putting in your body for your particular needs. Uh, in topic two, understanding what to be eating before game time. Very important, but in my opinion, probably more important is topic three and one of the most important topics up there. The recovery, the things that you do after each day's practice to better prepare for tomorrow's practice or tomorrow's competition. The things that you can actually do today, Sunday, to refuel from a week of tough training this past week to get you ready for the upcoming week. Not just to get the fuel back in the system, to, but to build and repair as well. So recovery is very important and too often overlooked by too many athletes. You know, I, I hear from coaches all the time. I get calls, Tim, what's the best pregame meal? We're at the, you know, we're at the sweet, you know, we're at the NCAA championships. And you know, the fact is, it, it, it's really what you're consuming, the weeks, excuse me, the days prior to a competition, which is essentially your recovery after previous workouts that will really dictate how well you perform on a game day. So you gotta be thinking ahead a little bit. As much as the pregame meal is important, it plays less of a role than what you're doing uh, the 24, 48, and 72 hours prior to. Fluid replacements, certainly always warrants mentioning the fluids, and as we will. And then any questions you might have about gaining weight, losing weight, what to be eating when you're traveling. That can be a challenge. I'm faced with the same challenges. You know, in and out of airports, on the road often, making the right choices can be difficult. Uh, fast food, snacks, supplements, which is a topic in itself that could you know, probably eat up five, six hours alone. Uh, it's overwhelming. Vitamin mineral needs, uh, eating disorders, dining hall tips, caffeine, alcohol, uh, diabetes, cholesterol, and the vegetarian athletes. So those are different topics that are available to you. What is it that's fueling your bodies in your particular sports? When you're out there training and competing during practices and competition, what is it that's fueling your bodies? Anybody? A C word. It's a fit. Calories, exactly. Calories, thank you. Calories. More often, folks say carbohydrate, which make up the calories. But calories, folks, are the gasoline for the working muscles. The calories that you put in your body each day, and enough of them, are the gasoline for the brain energy as well. And we need to keep the brain and the muscles prepared. Yet we live in a world today where we, we tend to think of calories as a bad thing. You know, we're, we're pushed to buy zero-calorie drinks and reduced-calorie foods. And, uh, and low calorie you know, uh, salad dressings, it's overwhelming. So we get this impression that calories are a bad thing and we associate calories as something that we should not have. Whereas for athletes, we need calories to sustain the demands on the field or on the court or on the ice, wherever you're training, in the pool. So calories are actually your friend for the athlete to fuel the muscles, to fuel the mind. How many calories do we need each day? Again, it varies depending on gender, depending on body size, depending on frequency, duration, and the intensity of your training. But when you're looking at how much fuel to put in the body each day, pretty simple calculations here. And over the many, many years of going around the or going through all your exercise phys books, these two formulas put you within about 10% of all the very complicated calculations and equations. When you think about how many calories you need each day, what's that magic number that's up pretty much on every consumer product? 2,000 calories. Well, in that fine print, it'll say 2,000 calories are what's needed if you're roughly 70 kilograms or 154 pounds. So 154 pounds, average American who does no athletics needs around 2,000 calories a day. Take your body weight, 
let's say for a female of 150 times 13, 1,950 calories. It's right there. Take your body weight of 150 for a male times 15, 2,250. It's within 10%. In my opinion, close enough. So all those complicated calculations and equations to factor in your total fuel requirements each day, it comes down to within about 10% of these two simple calculations. So if you're 180 pounds as a male, anybody 180? Roughly 180 times 15, your needs are 2,700 calories each day, not including your training, your strength training, your sports specific conditioning. So your needs are not 2,000. So this message that we tend to be influenced by in the media, through our consumer products, it's not the message for everybody. What may work and be needed for those that are sedentary doesn't necessarily mean it's the right message for the, the competitive athlete. Give you an example, a, uh, I was out at a Division I school out in the Midwest, Big 12 school, big large audience of 500 student athletes. A young lady asked in the middle of the presentation why I thought her swim times were suffering in the middle of the, in the peak of her season. And I asked her about her diet. You know, I didn't know this young lady and I asked her about her diet in front of the whole audience. She went on to tell me that she had gone home over the holiday for a quick visit, her folks, who were overweight, sedentary, were on this commercial diet. They were having great success in weight loss, which kudos to them, I commend them for that. She saw that success that they were having in terms of weight loss, took that same diet, continued with it for a few weeks in, in January back on campus, and over time, she was starting to feel fatigued. Well, I pointed out to her that particular diet program amounted to roughly 1,500 calories a day. Her body weight times the 13 and nearly 18 hours a week of, of swim conditioning demanded about 3,800 to 4,000 calories a day just for her to maintain her present body weight, maintain her speed, her strength, her power, her endurance in the pool. Yet she's taking in 1,500 and burning 3,800. No kidding, you're going to run out of gas. No kidding, you're going to swim slow over time because she was starting to break down what? Muscle, Muscle mass to try to sustain the demands that she was, was, was exceeding in terms of her caloric intake, her fuel intake, her gasoline intake. So there's an example of what might work for those that are sedentary, not doing D1, D2, D3 athletics versus those that are active like yourselves. The needs are entirely different. So keep that in mind when someone comes to you and says, hey, look how this has worked for me. Is their lifestyle the same as your lifestyle? So again, Fuel requirements, it all starts with here. If your goal is to lose weight, gain weight, you gotta know how many calories you're consuming each day to maintain present body weight. Yes? Is people having like different metabolisms that impact how many calories they need? Like Great question, great point. Your metabolism, genetically we're all predisposed to have a certain, some have a higher metabolism, some have a slower metabolism, and my answer to that is yes. When you take this number for yourself, and if your goal was to lose weight or gain weight and you see no changes, then I would adjust it by about 10%. Folks, I'm not asking you to sit around and count calories. I'm asking young athletes to recognize that your needs are greater than 2,000. When you look at your particular sports here, basketball, any hoop players in here? Okay, playing basketball, what's your, rough, what's your body weight roughly? Uh, like 185. 185. So the time will 180 right there. You're now 180. So 714 calories if you're running the hoop court for one hour. Granted, that's a continuous hour of running the court. But a two-hour practice, right, is typical, or even longer sometimes, right? So you're looking at maybe 1,400 plus calories. But even on the conservative side, let's say 1,400. Over and above your 180 times 15, which is, we pointed out, 2,700, in season, right now, in basketball season, for you to maintain your 185, you should be shooting for roughly 4,100 calories a day. And to your point about the question you just asked about metabolism, if it still isn't working, you'd have to bump it up 10%, another 400. If you find that you're gaining weight, that you don't want to weight, you back off about 10%. And that should put you pretty much right in the groove as to what you need. So again, your needs are 4,000, not 2,000 as the cereal box tells you. Everyone's needs as an athlete are different relative to your, the sport and, again, your, your mass. 
Any other questions or comments regarding that? Again, I talk a lot about calories, but as a good thing, you need them to fuel your body. I, was, I, I witnessed a uh, young division, uh, a division two female basketball player who um, was really to come, to come back in the fall, this was about a year or two ago, she was coming back in the fall, projected to be the starting point guard on this D2 women's basketball team going into her senior year. And she left in May, I think weighing around 150. She came back in August weighing 127. She lost 23 pounds. Somewhere along the line, someone got in her head that maybe a lower body weight would make her quicker on her feet, more agile, a better basketball player. And unfortunately, when she got back to campus, she learned very quickly that that body size that was not ideal for her. It might be an ideal body weight for some. I'm not saying you can't be a healthy 127 pound female basketball player, but for her, it wasn't. She not only lost her speed and her uh, strength and her power and so forth, uh, she lost her starting position as a result of it. She could not compete at the level she was used to competing at. And again, somewhere along the line, Someone told her that, or she got, got in her head that maybe a lower body weight was better. I'm not convinced. You have to be thin to be fit. I think what's important is for you as an individual athlete to find a healthy body weight that puts a smile on your face and allows you to perform out there at a, at a high competitive level and allows you to do it not just for one given competition or week, but the entire season. Yeah, folks ask me all the time, Tim, what, what, this is my height, what should my weight be? Who am I to tell you what your weight should be? You know, in fact, when you look at the body mass index that we're all pretty much familiar with, that number really doesn't work for the athlete because it doesn't factor in that muscle mass. When you take my height, and granted, I'm not as thin as I was in one day during my competitive years, but you take my height to my weight, I'm considered severely obese. And I don't buy into that. In fact, Serena Williams is on the brink of severe obese if you take her height to weight ratio and calculate it through the body mass index. Not to say that's not a good measurement for some, but it doesn't, in my opinion, pertain to you as athletes. So keep that in perspective, please. So again, taking your body weight times 15 or 13, and again, these are all, all this information is available to you online, so if you don't catch it today, you can access it. Looking at your different activities, for most of you in this room, you're burning four or 500 calories. For some of the larger males, 700 calories per hour. And all I want you to think about and remind yourself of is on a given day of competition or a given day of a long practice, say to yourself, I can't afford to miss breakfast this morning. I, I, I'm projected to have a lousy lunch because I didn't prepare. And now I got practice from two to five or two to four. You're gonna be in trouble. Because during two to four or three to five, whenever practice time is, you could be burning 800, 1200, 1400 calories, depending on body size. You gotta have that fuel in the system and the right types of fuel. So you can see the numbers are pretty, pretty close from one sport to the next. All the field and court sports are pretty, uh, pretty much within four to 600, four to 700 calories, depending on body size. Any questions or comments, anybody? Yes. That's a great question, great point. In terms of percentage of body fat, I think there's a, a good time to use it, percentage of body fat, as it means. I know I was just speaking to a Division I program in Connecticut where uh, their strength and conditioning office just got a, a new piece of equipment to measure percentage of body fat, and I think it's a good tool to have. I don't think it should be used on a regular basis. I think it should be sort of a preseason, midseason, postseason measurement, not a weekly thing. And I'll tell you why, I, I know at that same school a few years back, I get a call from a, a, one of the D1 female basketball players, freaking out, hysterical, crying on the phone. Tim, coach is all over me. She wants me to be at 22% body fat. Now the girl, is young lady is leading the league in rebounding at the time, second in the league in the conference, I should say, in scoring. She's a heck of an athlete and a great, great personality and she was at 22.4%. And she was losing her mind over this, you know, that, that little bit amount, getting to, getting to 22%. So 
In some ways, it can be destructive, I think. And I think, again, it, it's a great way to gauge the makeup of your body weight. I think, again, pre, mid, and post-season. And make those adjustments at, during those times. I just don't like to see folks get too obsessed with the number from week to week. But it is a great means of measuring. Because you can certainly start your season weighing 160 and end your season weighing 162, have lost four pounds of body fat and gained a few pounds of lean muscle mass, right? And that's a good thing. We, we want a better makeup of our total body weight. Does that make sense? Does that suffice in terms of? Great question. So again, different activities. And sort of uh, supporting what we were just talking about, a little bit recognizing uh, genetics plays a big role. Everybody's body is a little bit different. Um, and you have to uh, basically accept that and try not to make changes where you can't, in, in areas that you can't control. So the types of fuel. We're all familiar with the carb, the protein, and the fat. Probably don't have to go into too much detail as to what does what. But the fact of the matter is the carbohydrate is needed for moderate to high intensity activity. It is the preferred fuel for the working muscles. There's no way around that. Protein's primary and number one function is to do what? Build and repair. Build and repair. And when folks cut out number one in their diet, because of a trendy diet that tends to be swing, you know, swinging across the country, and people have seen some weight loss, and you cut out number one, that leaves you with the option of two things to fuel the body, protein and fat. Well, protein, where do we store it in the body? In muscle mass. So wait a second, I'm trying to get bigger and stronger, yet I'm willing to take amino acids, protein, and break it down out of my muscle tissue to fuel a workout? That sort of defeats the whole purpose of doing the strength training. Well, then the next theory is when you go on the low carb, no carb diet is, well, my other choice is I can use the fat. And granted, we only store about 2,000 carb calories in the body in a given day, 1,500 in the muscle, 500 in the liver. Those are our two fuel tanks we draw from in moderate to high intensity activity, court sports, field activities. Yet we have an abundance of stored body fat. When you talk about percentage of body fat, you can have anywhere from 30 to 60,000 or more fat calories on your body, as everyone in this room does in that large range. But we can't always tap into those fat calorie stores, that adipose tissue, as a means of energy because it's the preferred fuel for what? Low to moderate steady state activity. Reason being is at rest. You're using body fat stores and, 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 and fat circulating in the blood. As you get up out of your chairs and walk across this campus and go for a walk, you're using more fat. As you increase the exercise intensity and you get up above 60, 65, 70%, the predominant fuel being used are carbohydrates from that 2,000 calorie fuel tank, from the 1,500 in the muscle, 500 in the liver. And if that's not there, that 2,000 is not there because you choose to go low carb, no carb diet, you have a choice of protein or fat. So yes, you can burn body fat with the absence of carbohydrate, but it's gonna demand for your body to go and exercise at an intensity level below 65, 70%. Well, that's fine if you're just going out and training from one day to the next, but you can't show up to practice one day and say, hey coach, I'm trying to burn body fat and I don't put carbs in my body, so therefore I can only go 50%. That's not gonna fly. So my point is we need to have all three of these. We use them simultaneously when we exercise. And in fact, carbohydrate, enough of it, not too much, and the good carb, when we take in 2,000 throughout the day, you actually preserve your lean muscle mass. Because if you don't put the carbs in, going back to this, if you don't do carbohydrate, and you do demand protein as a source of energy, well, we mentioned we store it in the muscle. We have a little bit circulating in our blood as amino acids, enough to sustain a workout for about 15 to 20 minutes. So therefore, in a two hour practice, you would have to consume protein, get it to digest, get into the bloodstream during the workout to benefit from protein utilization as a source of energy. Well, that's one, hard to do. Two, it's difficult to digest it that quickly. 
So taking in and having enough healthy carbs in the body actually can preserve your lean muscle mass. Going back to that story at that school out in the Midwest where that swimmer was not doing the carbohydrates. That particular commercial diet program was a low carb, no carb diet. And she was utilizing those other two remaining energy stores, the protein and the fat. Well, her exercise swim intensity on a day-to-day -day basis for the most part, and certainly during competition, was well above 60%. So when you think about some athletes on a, um, in a, on a college campus, you got your you know, bigger, stronger athletes at some sports demand, like a football, uh, in terms of just stature. What's the one sport where maybe the stature is a little bit lighter in body weight? They're running, the cross country. Because cross country distance runners, as distance cyclists and other endurance athletes, they're doing a lot of training at that 50, 55%. They're burning half fat and half carbs. But those athletes hitting the ice, hitting the soccer field, the lacrosse field, the field hockey, the football, the basketball, where there's a lot of high intensity, intermittent type of activity, it's a lot of explosive stoppage. Explosive, most of the training's above that 60, 70%. So if you desire to lose and shed some body fat at any given time throughout the year, you've got to find time in your schedule, more likely out of season, because you don't want to overtrain in season, out of season where you could get out and walk this campus for an hour and a half. That burns body fat. Hitting the track and doing 100 meter sprints or 50 meter sprints is burning carbs. Going out for a nice slow jog or a rowing machine for an hour or swimming or the cycling, those long steady state type of activities. Better utilize the body fat stores. And this slide pretty much supports that. 50% of your max would be your warm up. The amount of carbs you're burning per minute is that 0.7 in the muscle tissue. Look at what it is at 100% all out explosive activity. The amount of carbs you burn is five times greater. The more you throw down the throttle, the more energy in the terms of that 2,000 carbohydrate fuel tank. And when you think about 2,000 carbohydrates in the body, it's not all that much. When you consider someone 180, you're burning 1,400 calories maybe in one workout, tough workout, and if 70, 80% of them are carbohydrate, you can see after a day or two days of heavy training, your carb stores can be depleted. So that's why going back to topic three, recovery is so important to refuel and to reestablish those fuel tanks to get you ready for the next day's workout. Just some big ways showing you the makeup of different, uh, maybe what the plate could be. And there's a lot of debate as to whether it should be 60% carb, 25%, you know, fat, you know, the, what's that, the 85, 15% protein. You know, it, I don't lose sleep over, you know, 5% here and there. You know, if you want to go 20% of your diet in the form of protein, no harm. You want to go 20% fat, there's 40, 60% carb. But if you do the math, more often, 60% of your 2,000 carbohydrate calories every day are pretty much what's needed to meet your requirements in practice if you're doing an average of two hours of practicing each day. How many train six days a week? How many train on average two hours on those given days? So you're doing 12 hours of conditioning in a given week. Anybody want to guess how many calories I burned the day I did the Ironman? <laughs> it was a lot. Same amount. Pardon me? Same amount. I, I burned 11,000 calories. Mm -hmm. It took me 12 hours. Started the Ironman at 7 in the morning, did the 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, <laughs> and the mountains around here, and then the marathon. It took me 12 hours. And in that 12 hour time frame, I burned 11,000 calories. And why I'm sharing that with you is you're doing your own Ironman in a given week. If you, if you think of it in terms of volume, yeah, granted it's broken up over six hours, or six, excuse me, six days, but you're burning, uh, you're burning, but you're going through at least 12 hours of conditioning. And if you're at that body weight closer to mine, doing that race, and it's 11,000, there's a good chance you could be burning 10, 9, 10, 11,000 in a given week for your training. Over and above someone on this campus who does know athletics. That's why your plate can often afford to be a little bit bigger for some in the dining hall. Or you might be able to afford that extra slice of pizza or the extra grilled chicken sandwich. 
or the one or two extra pancakes or the extra banana or the bigger bowl of cereal versus someone else's. Everybody's needs are a little bit different. In terms of breakfast, you know, it gets complicated when we talk about what to eat. We all have different likes. We have different dislikes in terms of choices. Um, breakfast, the most important meal of the day. And why is that? Fills you back for the rest of the Starts, day. Yeah, it sort of sets the stage for the entire day. But did you know for every one minute you sleep at night, you burn roughly one calorie? So if you were to get a good eight hours of sleep, I don't think you need 12, nor can you afford five or six. <laughs> I know it happens more often than you probably like. But a good sleep of maybe eight hours, 480 minutes, 480 calories, round it off to 500. But those calories that you're burning while you sleep at night, a good many of them are 500 of the 2,000 carbohydrate fuel tank, the 500 that are stored in the liver as liver glycogen. And it's that liver glycogen that we draw from first thing in the morning when you come to a classroom and got to use your brain for your academics. It's that 500 that are stored in the liver that give you the brain energy, the eye-hand coordination, the motor skills that you need if you have an early morning workout or training session. So therefore, having something first thing in the morning to replenish that 500 you burned sleeping at night <coughs> is important. Now, I know some prefer to sleep right in, right up to the start of class time or, or a lifting routine or whatever responsibility you have first thing in the morning. So I advise some athletes, due to their busy schedules, eat your four to 500 calories of breakfast before you go to bed at night. Now, how many have been taught not to eat before bed? There's another, in my opinion, bad message. Maybe for those that are sedentary and overweight to consume less before bed and not to consume the wrong foods. So it's not really a matter of what, whether you eat before bed. It's a matter of what you eat and how much. And my message to young competitive athletes like yourself, don't exceed 500 calories and make the best possible choice of those 500 calories. You're not going to gain weight having a grilled chicken sandwich and a small glass of milk before bed. The grilled chicken sandwich, 350 calories, 2% milk, 120, 470 calories. And you're getting probably 35, close to 40 grams of protein in that one particular combination when going to bed. It's a, ma it's a matter of uh, what, you, uh, what you eat and how much. And again, the mixed message there when people say, and I advise them they can eat before bedtime, oh, wow, I can have four slices of pizza. Now, having a single slice of pizza at 320 in terms of calories and a banana, maybe a weird combination, mm -hmm. there's 430 calories. Having a bowl of your favorite cereal with your milk, dairy milk, almond milk, whatever you choose, before bed, having a second one, 250, 250, 500 calories. But again, it doesn't mean a drive through at a McDonald's type restaurant where the Big Mac is 510 and the large order of fries are 440, and the beverage is 330, and you're, you're whacking back 1,300 calories. That's not the message. So it's a, ma a matter of managing, because you have two bowls of cereal before bed. Those, those, that cereal will be digested throughout the night, restore in the 2,000 calorie fuel tank, and better prepare you for an early morning workout and for the start of that afternoon's practice. When you abstain from any breakfast, you're playing catch up all along. You're not replenishing that liver glycogen, so your brain is starved of energy, needed energy. And did you know the 1,500 that are stored in the muscle, their primary function is to simply do that, work the muscles physically. They cannot kick back into the bloodstream for blood, uh, for blood glucose to the brain. Whereas the 500 that are stored in the liver, when the muscle glycogen gets depleted, they can serve as a backup. So it's very important to have that breakfast. And uh, you know, honestly, I always say to most, something is better than nothing. And granted, you know, two slices of whole wheat toast and a banana are far better than, a, than the donut. But I will tell you, the donut's better than doing nothing. So it doesn't give you a free for all on, on the donuts in the morning. It is Sunday though, you can have your donut. Um, but having something, very important. Any questions regarding your breakfasts? Anything? Yes. Um, 
so say if you had like an early morning workout, is there some foods that are better because like say if you need to digest quickly? Yeah. So for the early morning workout, where are we right here? Oh. For the early morning workouts, there we go. Just talking about what you're expending while you sleep at night. Having that three to 400 calories, maybe a small portion of the 500 before bed. I often have a turkey sandwich before bed and a small glass of milk. It's a little bit of protein, calcium, potassium, vitamin B12, vitamin D, a whole combination of things. Then I wake up in the morning and if I go and swim at the local YMCA at 6.30, at six o'clock, I'm pretty close to the local Y at six o'clock, I might grab myself a small 100 calorie energy bar or breakfast bar or a banana is 110 calories. I might just grab a slice of whole wheat bread right out of the bag, 105 calories. What is most and quickly easily digested are, is something like a starch. And I know the starches tend to get the bad rap because we assume the pasta, the rice, the breads are what have made us overweight over the, over the last number of decades. You know, how about the fries and the burgers and the cheese and the bacon that go on those burgers? And the soft drinks that used to be 12 ounces at 160 calories are now being served out of your convenience store at 24 ounces. We have supersized so much of the convenient foods that are you know, delivered to us. That's the real issue in terms of the weight gain. But first thing in the morning, a banana, soft in texture. An apple is very healthy for you. But is it a preferred choice 30 minutes before? No, nah, because it's harder in texture, a little more difficult to digest. And granted, we, we're trying to get the fiber out of, out of the apple. It's a great healthy choice, but not necessarily 30 minutes before. So my go-to is actually an English muffin. Little bit of peanut butter spread on it. The English muffin's 130 calories. Only about 40 calories of peanut butter, 170. I eat it on the way up to the local Y. Bottle of water, my bottle of water or a little bit of sport drink. That's my go-to, but keep it simple. It is the simplest foods that are the ones that are softer in texture, that are more easily digested and readily available on days of training, on days of competition. I tell athletes all the time, the day of competition is not the time for coaches to really satisfy your palates. It's the time for you, the coaches, if, if it were an organized meal on the road or yourself to satisfy your energy demands. And more often, it's the simplest foods. When I'm asked by athletes, why do coaches always give us pasta? A number of responses to that. One, it's inexpensive, all right? Fits within the budget. Two, you can serve a lot and goes a long way. And three, it works. It's what works. And yes, whole wheat pasta is better than white bleach pasta. I agree with that. But honestly, I'd rather see an athlete have pasta with some type of protein on it then have the burgers and fries before a meal, or excuse me, before a training session or a competition. So it's the simplest foods that tend to be the most effective in terms of getting you ready on days of competition. A lot of my own training, doing, my mar or doing the Ironman training for six months, a lot of PB&Js on whole wheat, a lot of bananas, a lot of the energy bars, things of convenience, things that are easily digested, yet delivered, a balance of carbohydrate, protein, and healthy fats. I kept it simple. I kept it to about five different choices. I didn't want to complicate it. So if you know something is good, healthy-wise, and it sits well with you on game day, go with it. If it's your bowl of Wheaties and some strawberries on it, it's a great choice. Aside from the fact that it's extremely healthy, it's a great source of energy for the upcoming training session. Going back to, uh, did that help answer the question? Going back to choices for the breakfast. You know, the pancakes have sort of gotten a bad rap over the years. What is it that we put on our pancakes that are the bigger mm -hmm. issue? Syrup. The syrup, the refined sugar. It's like pouring, you know, Pepsi or Coke on top of your pancakes. That's what it is. It's refined sugar. And it's not to say you can't have pancakes with the syrup, but it's using it in moderation. A quarter cup of syrup is 250 calories. The three pancakes, seven inch in diameter, they're about 360 calories. 360 for the cakes, 250 for the syrup. The butter, not maybe another 120, 150 calories. The issue is not the pancakes in terms of weight gain. 
or overeating. It's the condiments, the add-ons that we put onto our pancakes or our waffles or our pasta even. It's not the pasta itself. It's whether you do the Alfredo cream sauce versus the red sauce, whether you add a protein to it. And I'm a firm believer in having a protein at every meal with your healthy carb. It helps to keep things balanced. It helps to balance the blood sugar in terms of how your body responds in terms of insulin. So having uh, you know, two scrambled eggs with three pancakes and a banana, in my opinion, is a great pregame morning of competition meal three hours before. You notice I didn't say the bacon and the sausage, right? <laughs> the great tasting breakfast meets its many like. Save those maybe for the following day. But on game day, they don't deliver much. They're not providing much in terms of energy on game day. Because high in fat, high in sodium, high in, not even that high in protein. Yes? You don't like eggs. Do you like yogurt? Yeah. Do you like Greek yogurt? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Okay. I, the reason I ask I is how, how many eat yogurt? Any type of yogurt. So over the years, we've had, let's say, the traditional Danny yogurt, the one, the one cup serving, 240 calories, 8 grams of protein. Yeah, about 40 grams of, of carbohydrate, much of which was sugar, added sugar. But 240 calories, 8 grams of protein, 400 milligrams of, of calcium. Take the Greek yogurt. It's gone from 240 calories, the same serving size, to about 150 to 160. So now we've lowered the calories. It's gone from 8 grams of protein to nearly 15 to 17 grams of protein. So the Greek yogurt, lower in calories, higher in protein, because less of what? The added sugar. But a great source of calcium, potassium, B12, vitamin D. So you can get a great source of of protein from your yogurts, and even more so the Greek yogurts. And using them, not just simply eating them out of the container, but mix them with, throw some of your favorite cold cereal in there. Uh, throw, them in, throw, the, throw the stuff in the, the yogurt in a blender, and put a banana in there, a little scoop of peanut butter in there, and some, maybe a little bit of chocolate milk, and make up a smoothie or a little shake of your own that is protein rich, for a fraction of the cost of going and buying a protein supplement and getting the equal return, or if not a better return, without the risk of anything illegal or harmful being in that beverage. So yogurt would be a good choice. Um, you know, sometimes I do, this might sound crazy, but I do a, a toasted bagel in the morning. I like my starch in the morning. I like some toast or a cold cereal or oatmeal, but I'll do a toasted bagel. I'll slice up some leftover grilled chicken Spread a little avocado, tomato, a little olive oil, put the grilled chicken on there. It's a breakfast sandwich. That's my breakfast sandwich without the egg. But it's protein, carbohydrate rich. It could be a lunch sandwich as well. Question? Going off the protein thing, is there any like added benefits like whey protein or casein protein or different types? Well, the whey, great question. The whey protein or casein protein, if there is, if you are going to use a, a, a protein supplement, the whey and the casein, I think, are the, are the safer bets. They're more consistently, uh, the ingredients are more consistent. Um, and they're, they're a high quality protein. And my position on the, on the protein supplements are this, folks. If you don't get enough protein in a given day, and your needs are roughly, your needs are roughly, step back here, about a half a gram to one gram, I'm sorry, one, a half a gram to one gram per pound of body weight. So, what's your body weight, roughly? 195. 195, so let's just round it up to 200. You just gained five pounds. <laughs> what's it mean to me? So you're really, you're looking, at, you're looking at roughly 100 grams, which would be a half a gram per pound of body weight. In season, when you do less strength training, correct? It's a maintenance. Believe it or not, when you're out of season doing more strength training to get bigger or stronger, you might bump it up to one gram per pound of body weight. So the range could be a half, excuse me, 100 grams to 200 grams throughout the year. Well, if that yogurt, one cup serving is 17 grams, and your piece of grilled chicken the size of your iPhone 6 is another 35 grams, and over a given day you have some other sources, some of you can eat very easily be close to 100 grams. Yet if you did not eat the yogurt or the grilled chicken, 
or some other good quality protein sources. And at the end of the day, you're back in your dorm room or your apartment, and you go, wow, I didn't eat much protein today. And I need 100, at least I'm gonna try to get 100, 150 grams. If you wanna take your powder and put it in a little blender and put some milk in there and a banana in there and, and get a 40, 50 gram serving, more power to you. My point is when using protein supplements, use them with caution, but use them to complement the meal plan and fill the void on days where you're not getting your target intake. Rather than thinking that more protein is going to make me bigger and stronger. How do we get bigger and stronger? By going to the weight room or going to your fitness center and do, being consistent with your strength training and your cross training. That's how you get bigger. You know, if it were simple sitting at the juice bar, we'd all sit around and drink protein shakes all day or for a two hour workout and get bigger and stronger. When you look at a, a pound of muscle and each pound of muscle you're trying to achieve in terms of weight gain, healthy weight gain, what's one pound of muscle made up of? What percentage of pure protein is in a pound of muscle? Anybody know? About 22%. 74% roughly of every one pound of muscle is water weight. Water. 22% of a pound of muscle is pure protein. Therefore, without going into all the math, if you want to gain a pound of muscle per week through consistent strength training, good diet, it really only amounts to an extra probably 20 to 30 grams of protein a day, over and above what you, <coughs> you've been taking to make sure. <coughs> Bless you. What's 20 to 30 grams? 20 to 30 grams, that one, that one Greek yogurt, 17 grams. That piece of grilled chicken, the size of your iPhone, 35 grams. So it's not that difficult to get that additional, those additional needs. Yes, sir. What's my position on that? That's been a controversy for, for decades. And I think the safest bet is it's like all foods. Consuming it in smaller portions allows our body to, I think, to be more efficient in digesting it and metabolizing it. So yeah, I think anytime you load the system, whether it's carb, protein, or fat, with a large volume, I think uh, it's, it's more difficult to process it. So I would say, you know, there's numbers anywhere from 30 to 50 grams per serving as the max. You know, and so if you need, think about it, if you need 150 grams of protein a day, it still goes back to three meals a day, 50 at this meal, 50 at this one, and 50 at that one. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're at 150. Now, 50 grams of protein at lunch might be a little bit easier than getting it at breakfast. Because lunch, you can, you can get it from that grilled chicken sandwich and a side of rice and a glass of milk. And dinner, the same thing with a protein dish, you know, as an entree with a side of, you know, healthy rice, brown rice, pasta, you can get it there. Whereas breakfast, you go back to the eggs, the yogurt, is being, and, and probably the dairy, or even the almond milk as your, being, your main sources of protein in the morning. So maybe having one scoop in the morning with a shake and a breakfast, and then a normal lunch and dinner, it's going to get you to your target intake. Yes, sir. Ready? plan over a given 24 hours. I don't scrutinize the meal and the diet from hour to hour or from meal to meal, but rather over 24 hours. When do we achieve most of our gains? What time of day? When we're sleeping. When our head is resting on that pillow is when the liver, believe it or not, comes alive and says, okay, thank you for all the amino acids you gave me from that chicken you just said you had at lunch and dinner. I'm going to take those amino acids, that protein, Distribute it around the body where needed for building and repairing. That's when you achieve a lot of the gains. So I think most importantly, it's, you know, it's spreading things out throughout the day is better. The studies have shown not just about protein, but about meal, meals in general and controlling calories. They've shown those that consumed four and five and six small meals a, a day were better served in terms of managing a healthy body weight than those that ate two big meals a day. And I would think it's the, you can associate that with what types of, of, of the energy nutrients as well. So at the end of the day, if you didn't have much at breakfast and much at lunch, and you want to have three pieces of grilled chicken 
at dinner, I, I'd go with it. You know, I mean, it's, you look, a piece of grilled chicken is 250 calories. It might be 32 grams, there's 100 grams of protein. I mean, that's only 400 calories of, of pure protein. It's not that as much as it, it sounds. But you're better served giving it into the system to build and repair for the upcoming day rather than coming up short. So what will happen if I don't consume too much protein? Okay, great, that's a good point. So yes, there is one consequence, consuming more protein than our, than our body needs in a given day. And what is that? You can gain additional what? Oh, fat. fat, exactly. One of the risks, one of the risks of consuming too much protein, if, if it's not used to build and repair, and if you're taking in a healthy amount of good healthy carbs for energy, it can risk a stored, as stored body fat as adipose tissue. Now, I'm not saying this is the association, but when you think about some of the offensive defense alignment we see at the very high level, you know, at the pro level, for example, some of them have some pretty big guts, don't they? I'm sure that it's a volume of food that they eat, but also maybe taking in more protein than their body actually needs may result in that weight gain. So again, it's a balance. It's a balance throughout that day. Moving along, um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on the fat. You know, we need fat at every meal. You know, the good healthy fats are generally those that are liquid at room temperature. One slide I like to share because a very commonly consumed food in our diet today is cheese, right? We put cheese on our bagels in the morning and we put cheese on our egg sandwiches and we put it on our turkey sandwich and then we have, you know, cheese over our nachos mid-afternoon and then we have, you know, some lasagna for dinner in the dining hall and we order cheese pizza that night. And yet we want to blame the carbohydrate as to why we're gaining weight. And I'm not saying cheese is a result of weight gain. But the makeup, a slice of American cheese, 105 calories roughly, 9 grams of fat, so that's 81 of the 106 calories are fat calories. So it's over 70% fat. So if you do consume too much of it, it could result in weight gain. It's a pleasure food, no question. And you should have some of it if you like it. But you've got to use it with, with caution as well. I know it delivers a little bit of protein and calcium and so forth but at the expense of a higher fat intake. <coughs> How many like feta cheese? One of my favorites. Feta cheese, much, about 25%, fewer calories, less fat, great in pita pockets, great in your wraps, on your salads, on your omelet dishes, a great alternative. Talk, we talked about the early morning workouts. In terms of meal timing, a little bit different from one athlete to the next, from one team to the next. But a general rule of thumb, around three to four hours before game time. <coughs> Anywhere from 500 up to 1,000 or more calories, depending on body size. Before my competitions, I was very consistent. PB&J on whole wheat, banana, a sport drink, and that was my combination of roughly 700 calories. It was my go-to. And if needed, pretty much all 700 calories were available to me at that given, in, in those given hours that followed. All easily digested. As you get closer to training, closer to competition, the less you can afford to have. Just naturally because it's more difficult to digest and won't be as quickly available. Keeping it simple, thinking ahead. If you got a, anybody have a Wednesday competition this week? <coughs> Thursday, Tuesday? Anybody? Anybody have a competition this week? Tuesday. Tuesday. What you do today and Monday, far more important than that meal three hours before. Refueling those 2,000 calorie fuel tanks. So when you show up on Tuesday, the fuel tank is not at 200, but rather maybe 1,500. You eat a pregame meal three, four hours before, it pushes the needle right to full, you're ready to roll. It's pre existing stores that you'll be drawing from on Tuesday, meaning today's food and fluid intake, Monday's food and fluid intake. Those athletes that neglect the diet for five days. Monday through Friday, have a Saturday competition, think, okay, I'll have a good pregame meal, I'll be set to go. At that point, it's too late. You gotta be thinking ahead. I wanna jump along to, uh, ahead to the uh, recovery, being important. In terms of timing, 30 to 60 minutes, right after practice is critical, within the first 30 to 60 minutes. 
and it should be a combination of protein and carbohydrates. Number roughly around 400 calories. I just keep it simple, about 100 of those protein. So 20 to 25 grams of protein within the first 30 to 60 minutes to help to build and repair, to start the process to get you best ready for tomorrow's practice and that 400 calories. How many do not have an appetite right after practice? Look at all the hands, and I'm telling you, you need to consume something. <laughs> Three goals right after a workout. Yes, take in some protein to build and repair, but that <coughs> requires eating and drinking something, and you might not want to do that. Second goal, refuel with carbohydrate. So a sport drink would satisfy those needs. A fruit juice would satisfy those needs. And ultimately, we need to rehydrate. So worst case, right after practice, you drink plain water, you're taking care of one of the three things. Drink a sport drink or fruit juice, you're taking care of the water and the carbohydrate solution. Drink chocolate milk, for example, you're taking in the water, the carbohydrate, and the protein. As you've probably read over the years, this, this beverage itself has become very popular as a recovery beverage. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are many products out there being sold now, the muscle milk products, mm -hmm. uh, all different brands. In my opinion, they're nothing more than a glorified chocolate milk. If you look at the nutritional label on those products, they're all within the 315 calories. They're all within roughly the 16 grams of protein. I know a few of them have 18 grams, pretty close. They all have some carbohydrate. They actually don't have more often as much, excuse me, as much as the calcium and potassium that regular milk has. Look at, for example, just Gatorade, 16 ounces, delivers 60 milligrams of potassium. The same serving size volume of the chocolate milk delivers 851 milligrams. Big difference. And if you don't do dairy, if you're allergic, lactose intolerant, do the almond milk. Do the silk products. They got all different flavored silk products that are now fortified with additional protein and calcium. Great alternative. A few more minutes. What else are some of your questions? You've had some great questions so far. I thank you for that. Recovery, real important. Just refueling. From the time you're walking off the field, back to your dorm, back to your apartment, from the time you're walking off your field to getting on the bus, having something on the bus is critical. Hydration, carbohydrate solution, protein, three goals. Do the best you can do with those combinations, trying to get those three combinations. And in terms of the hydration, what's very important is to recognize whether you're properly hydrated throughout the week and how do you determine that? The color of your what? Of your urine. The color of your urine, when you go to the bathroom, the darker the yellow, more often, the more dehydrated you are. Drink lots of fluids until that urine comes out clear. The more frequently you visit the ladies' room or the men's room, or any bathroom, more likely you are to consuming that you've been consuming a lot of fluids. And the little bit of that inconvenience will pay off if you do that Sunday and Monday, we'll pay off Tuesday in your competition. It's well worth it. It's well worth the investment of going frequently because that's dictating the need to get rid, rid of those fluids. That means you're drinking plenty. And as a rule of thumb, eight ounces every 15 minutes during a practice. You lose on average. You know what the 32-ounce Gatorade bottle looks like as a visual aid? Mm -hmm. That size water bottle, 32 ounces, one liter, call it, is what you lose per hour of practice on average. Some less, some more, depending on the weather and so forth, but on average. So in a two-hour practice, two of those equals eight ounces every 15 minutes. You've been taught to drink how many glasses of water a day? What we're taught in health class? Eight eight-ounce eight glasses. That's one, two bottles. Then for every day of two hour practices, third bottle, fourth bottle to achieve that total fluid intake. Because your goal is to keep those muscles that are 74% water weight, to keep them at 74%. Because when you start perspiring and sweat loss happens, right? If you don't replenish it, what happens eventually? You start to muscle cramp, right? You will fatigue early and potentially you're compromising your competition and your health, not to mention.
What are some closing questions, comments? Anything? Anything on the hydration? I ran through that pretty quickly. I'm off of that. Go ahead. What do you think about BCAs? BCAs? Well, the branch chain amino acids, the BCAs, have been around for decades. And they're marketed in different fashions and in, in packaged differently. And many hype and claims are made. The whole theory behind them is that they're more quickly and easily digested or metabolized, I should say, in the, and, in the bloodstream and utilized quicker. I don't lose sleep over the speed of my protein intake or, or protein digestion. Um, you know, when you compare the branched chain amino acids in a supplement form, in a serving, recommended serving size versus a four ounce serving of beef or chicken or fish, the amount of amino acids, excuse me, branched chain amino acids and amino acids in general far exceed in the whole foods. So it's just another means of taking it in a simple fashion, a thing of convenience. And it's the same message with the energy bars. There's nothing magical about them. You know, they're just a package of carbohydrate, protein, and fat in a nice 250 calorie bar with, you know, anywhere from 10 to 12 grams of protein. And they fill the void at times. I have some that tell me, well, they're nothing but sugar and they're nothing but a glorified candy bar. Well, find me a candy bar that can deliver 15 grams of protein and 50 to 100% of a long list of vitamins and minerals. You can't. So I think they do have a void. In between practices, in between classes, post game, whenever it's convenient for you to have two or three in your bag, they can fill the void when you can't get to the dining hall, when you can't make a healthy choice, or you're walking by the vending machines in a building like this, and it's between you know, the, the Butter Crunch bar or the Cliff bar. I'll tell you right now, the Cliff bar is going to deliver a lot more for your two bucks because it does have the protein, the vitamins, and minerals. Yes? NBA players going vegan. Um, I think a vegan diet is very sustainable for the athlete. It does require knowledge. It requires making sure you're getting, when you look at the size of their bodies, an adequate amount of healthy and a variety of protein, which can be the challenge. Iron, zinc, and other nutrients that are associated with the protein. So it can be done. It just requires some good guidance, good information. Um, in terms of they have a lot more energy, more than likely, those that go vegan are the same ones that were eating a lot of burgers and fries. So I think any of us, whether you play in the NBA or not, go to a more vegetable-based diet versus a high-fat, high-saturated fat, high-sodium high diet, I think we're all going to feel better. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to make light of that. But I think a vegan diet is perfectly fine. It just requires careful planning to get that adequate amount of protein. Because if you need 150 grams, you need it whether you're a vegan or not. So you just have to... Do a light, the right combination of plant protein, brown rice, you know, the whole grains, the different beans and nuts and so forth. Yes? Um, due to our conference, a lot of our team played two days in a row on the weekend. Any extra tips for, you know, teams doing this kind of What sport? Well, well, All sports. the sports. Okay, but a lot, a lot of the sports. sports. Yeah. yeah, so if you've got two games on a weekend, you're <clears throat> packing a lot in there. It's Wednesday, Thursday, and fr half of Friday the right recovery each day. Things that you can encourage as team leaders, as coaches, to get your kids to refuel the things that they're doing Thursday are really gonna dictate how well they perform on multiple competitions on a Saturday or Sunday, for example. Um, if you neglect the body Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're shot for those two competitions. I don't care how good the pregame meal is. So one, encouraging that recovery. Getting them to graze on small portions. You guys live in a very, uh, you live in an environment where your schedules are not traditional nine to five schedules, like many in the workforce or nine to six. You guys have crazy schedules. Snacking is good all day long, right into the time you lay your head on the pillow, but the snacks should be the Greek yogurts, they should be the bananas, the PB and J's, the turkey sandwich. I see them as snacks. Grazing on small two and three and 400 calorie servings all day long. And the same thing, encouraging your athletes to do that on those multiple days of competition, having a lot packed in their bag when you're at that venue. Does that help in a very short, short response? Yes? What are your thoughts on geese? On geese? <laughs> yeah. 
Red beets? No. My wife loves red beets. She eats them right out of the... Uh, yeah, that's uh, what I said. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the beet juice can be a little bit higher in, in, in sodium. Depends how it's prepared. Um, I don't know. I, I don't... You know, I never gave much thought about the beets. <laughs> 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 like a tree, I like to reduce for cognitive time or something. The beets? <laughs> I think the potassium that is associated with pickles and beets in pickled items is associated as a, a good choice. But we can get, what's one of the best sources of potassium? Yeah. Everyone says banana, 300 milligrams plus. Your Dan and yogurt, Greek yogurt, 470 milligrams. Eat the skin of your baked potato and the baked potato itself as a whole, 750 milligrams. There are a lot, bananas are great choices, but there's other very uh, 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 nutrient dense sources of, of the potassium. I think I might have exhausted my time. I'm never exhausted. I can keep talking. Folks, I'm around, you know, through the rest of the afternoon. If you would like to answer or, excuse me, ask me any more questions, feel free. Uh, I'll stay up here afterwards. I, know, I think there's a lunch period now, correct? I know you're anxious for that. But, folks, before you go, again, I thank you for your time. There's a wealth of information that is available to you through the web portal that you'll have access to at no charge. The manual itself. Anything that comes to mind in the upcoming weeks, months, these great questions you shared with me today. If you have another one, feel free to, uh, my Twitter account is eat to compete one or just simply tim at eat to compete.com, my direct email, fire away. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. So thank you, have a very safe year and a very successful one. Thank you. Coach and psychology professor at Lafayette College. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about preparing uh, mentally for competition. And I'm going to take a little, two different angles here when we talk about this. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we can take care of our mind in general. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about mental health and um, how, what that means and why that matters for taking our, care of our mind for competition, how those things are connected. Um, so taking care of our minds, like I said, generally, and then also how we can learn some skills so that we can be more intentional, intentional, I did that in the other one too, uh, intentional about, um, about applying some of those skills to competition so that we can prepare our minds better for competition to hopefully perform a little better, but also maybe to enjoy competition a bit more as well. So I would like you to raise your hand if you've ever been sick and or injured. <laughs> Right, yes. If, if you haven't raised your hand, I'm like, okay. how? How is that possible? Okay. How many of you have ever sought help when you've been sick and or injured? So gone to a doctor, a parent, someone in the medical field. Okay. How many of you actively work on preventing or managing sickness or injury? Right? We're all supposed to do something. Okay. So I think that gets at the, the point that we're pretty good, and especially as athletes, we know that physical health is important, right? We know that physical health is a key component in whether we can perform um, on the field, but even off the field. We know that it's key to our well-being, right? So we know that um, we have to be aware of our physical health, right? Like how our body feels, what's happening with it on a day-to-day -day basis, um, even sometimes a moment-to-moment -moment basis. We also know that we have to train it, right? We have to do certain things to help ourselves physically be able to perform um, the way that we want to. So that might mean lifting weights or running or practicing certain skills. Um, we also know that if there's something wrong physically or something doesn't feel right, um, that we can go get some help for that. So maybe a coach or an athletic trainer or a strength and conditioning coach, right? We know we can ask for help in that. Um, if our hamstring doesn't feel quite right or our arm doesn't feel quite right or we're feeling a little sick, we know to go ask somebody for help for that, right? So physically, we're kind of, we're, we're getting better at, at taking care of ourselves physically. But what we don't often um, do or what we overlook a lot of times is our mental health, right? Which is just as key to performance and our, our overall well-being as physical health. But as athletes, um, and generally, as people, we're not great, but especially as athletes, we're not great at, at um, both, um, being aware of, training, and getting help when we need to for our mental health. Why do you think that might be? What are, what are some reasons that you think that we might not be great at that? What do you think? Yeah. It's less obvious. Yeah. If you're injured, you know you're injured. 
Right, it's less obvious, right? It, and, and other people sometimes physically can see that you're injured, right? It's not even, maybe we don't even have to be aware of it, other people can see it, so it's less obvious, absolutely. What else? Why else might we not be great at that? Yeah? Um, there might be a stigma of being like mentally weak or not having mental toughness. Right. Exactly, right? Especially that word mental, that phrase mental toughness now, right? Where we hear that a lot. And so sometimes we think that's counter. Like if you, if you don't have mental toughness, then you're like mentally weak if you have to ask for help. Um, rather than seeing actually a, a part of mental toughness is knowing when you're not okay, right? So we kind of, but sometimes we see the most counter. So if I have to ask for help or something's going, you know, not, not quite right emotionally or in my thought process, then that's seen as weak. Yeah. Anything else? Any other reasons? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot of it, right? That we sometimes don't think that it's, it's okay to not be okay, right? We think, I have to be strong for my sport. I have to be seen as tough. I can't ask for help. Sometimes we, and, and I, I will say even, I say we take care of ourselves physically, but sometimes we even, when we're injured, sometimes push ourselves a little too far. But especially mentally, we're, we're not great at being not okay, right? And so what we want to get to, to, or one of the takeaways of this talk, is that it is okay to not be okay. Because we all are going to have times when we are not okay. It's just a fact of life, right? It's a fact of, of who we are as human beings, that we're people too. So Brian Hainline, who's the chief medical officer of the NCA, one of the big um, sort of initiatives that they have going on right now is around mental health and bringing more awareness and trying to break some of that stigma of having to be strong and push past stuff and um, not pay attention to this thing. And, and, you know, he says rightly, right, people are people. It's not that athletes are any different than people. Being an athlete is, yes, it's a big part of what you do, but it's, a, it's just a part of what you, what you do, part of who you are, and not all that you are, and so you're people too. And so we need to be making sure that we're paying attention to that. So uh, let's talk a little bit about mental health, right? What do we mean? What's that about? Um, what are we talking about here? So first I want to just reiterate, right, that there's this health continuum. So physical health and mental health are part of this health continuum. So if we kind of pretend like there's not such a difference as physical and mental health, because in reality they're linked anyway, right? But if we just think about health overall, we have this continuum where from healthy to ill, okay, we're healthy, everything is functioning normally, we feel great, there's not really much that we need to do, we just kind of take care of those little fluctuations, but otherwise things are working the way that, that we want them to or that they should. When we're reacting, we're sort of in that, con like there's common but reversible, right? So there's some distress there. So if you think about it from an injury standpoint, maybe like your hamstring's a little tight, right? So I gotta pay a little bit more attention to my hamstring so that I don't injure it. And so with our mental health, you might think, I'm, I'm kind of stressed today because I have this exam and, and I'm, I've been feeling stressed or I, I you know, uh, broke up with someone or, or a you know, professor gave me a, a grade I didn't like or whatever the case might be, right? So it's something we have to kind of pay attention to, but usually something that we can bounce back from um, with some coping mechanism and things like that. Injured, where we have more significant functional, functional impairment, right? Where we, we probably need to get some help to get better. Right? So if we're sick, like let's say we have the flu, right? I know that's, we're all crossing our fingers because that's going around right now. Um, we would probably need to go get some medical help for the flu, right? Um, but then we can bounce back from it and there might be some challenges or some things we need to manage in there. Um, and the same can happen with, with uh, aspects of our mental health. And then in that ill category where we probably need to do some real things to be able to manage or cope with what's happening. Um, and so, the, and the key here with, in the ill category is that it's severe and persistent. So it's severe, but it also lasts. Now the key is that in any of these places, we can still perform, right? We can still perform, we can still go about our lives, we can still do the things that we wanna do. But the key is what is it that we're having to manage or cope and how to do those and that there might be more challenges in those areas. So for example, if we're thinking about this like if you have, um, let's say you have severe asthma, right? Does that mean that you can't ever play your sport? No, of course not. It just means that there's things that you need to do to manage and cope with that asthma to help, um, you know, to be able to play that sport. It just means that you probably need to have your inhaler, you know, at the ready. There's probably you know, maybe it's Advair or something like that that you take on a regular basis, 
okay, so that you're managing and coping with that. And so that's, and that's a, a part of sort of physical health, but it's the same with mental health. Even if we get over into this category, let's say something like clinical depression, doesn't mean that we can't perform and still live, live out our lives. It just means that there might be some challenges or things that we have to manage, okay? Um, so at any place in, in, on this continuum, we can still perform uh, and live our lives the way we want to. We just have to manage those challenges a little differently and be, be able to recognize those, right, and be willing to, to talk about them and to get help. And so if we think about this from a mental health perspective, just to give you some idea of what are some of those things that you might look out for on that continuum. So when we're in healthy, we're sort of in those natural mood fluctuations, right? We know our mood fluctuates. Sometimes we feel great, sometimes we're not so happy, and all of those sorts of things. Sometimes we're a little anxious, and then sometimes we're calm. Those normal mood fluctuations, and we're able to handle those as they come. When we're in that reacting, maybe those mood fluctuations stay a little longer. Maybe they, they um, persist a little bit longer. Maybe they're there for a, a little longer time. Um, we have some trouble sleeping, a lot of times falling asleep. Maybe that mouse wheel of our, of our brain is going, some difficulty with uh, social interaction, things like that. Okay? But usually, we can employ some coping mechanisms and get back to, to the green. And we might, and this might be because of an event, like I said, like we got a test back or something exciting happened or we're about to play or something like that. When we're in that sort of injured, right, these things again start to come up in severity. And a lot of times, one of the main ones here is that sleep, right? We're not sleeping well. Um, and we notice that. There might be some more anger or anxiety rather than some of those, you know, natural mood fluctuations. Um, we start to withdraw a little bit. Okay, and when we're in that ill or, or sort of clinical view, um, we have significant difficulty with these things. Okay, so the severity of those, uh, of all of those, increases, um, and we're so we're feeling very overwhelmed. Our mood, our depressed mood, you know, persists. Right. So the key to these are really that severity and persistence, and that the the other key is that it's a continuum, and so we can fluctuate. Right. You're not always just going to be in one area or another. Okay, when you get over here, yes, some of these things may persist, and that might pre create challenges or things that we have to manage, um, but a lot of times we're moving in and out along this continuum. Okay, so we're fluctuating. So our mental health, just like our physical health, fluctuates. And it's just what we have to kind of keep track of, see where we're at, and then employ whatever strategies we might need um, depending on that. So how would we know where we are on the continuum? How would we know where we are on the continuum? What do you think? We have to be aware of it, right? We have to kind of see where we are and know what some of the signs are, depending on where, where we might be and how we might feel about them. So what are some of those warning signs? What are some of those things that we should be aware of from a mental health perspective to see and make sure and sort of see where we are on that continuum, okay? So things like a loss of interest. <clears throat> and what I mean by that, is where you know we something that we have previously always enjoyed doing, we don't really like doing it anymore. Okay, so we want to notice when that starts to happen, and not from like a, I've outgrown it, but from like a, I just don't really feel like doing it anymore. But probably if I did feel like doing it, I'd still like it. So things like high stress and high stress that persists, right? Like for stress because of an exam, that's different than stress where I feel stressed all the time. Okay. So where is that stress happening? Changes in sleep. Changes in sleep are one of the number one indicators in terms of um, maybe looking at managing or coping with, with something going on for us. Either not being able to fall asleep or maybe you can't really get up in the morning or you want to nap a lot. Those sort of things are, are indicators that maybe we need to look at what's going on. Uh, difficulty interacting, meaning that those relationships that you have maybe, um, you know, they're, they're not as easy as they were, or you're really not um, you know, being able to manage those relationships in the ways that you want to. Um, low energy, not feeling like you really have energy to do things. Um, change in demeanor. So again, if you think about some of those relationships, how you used to be um, with other people, or like easygoing, and now you're much more irritable than easygoing, right? So noticing how am I changing in those ways unmanageable emotions so again is my anxiety so high that I can't manage it or am I just really sad all of the time and what does that sadness feel like it's not 
you know, sometimes we think of depression as just sadness, but more, more multifaceted than that. But what are some of those emotions and are they unmanageable, meaning that I can't get past them and I can't do anything with them? Um, decreased performance, so both in the classroom, out of the classroom, in, in all sorts of ways that you are, and difficulty focusing, right? Can I concentrate? Can I focus? Or is my mind kind of all over the place? Am I a million miles away all the time? Or, can, or th are things like fuzzy? That sort of thing. And like I said, the key really is the severity and persistence. You might have all of these at some point or another, right? But if they persist, right, over a week, over two weeks, over three weeks, that's when we want to look at that and say, okay, maybe something needs to change here. Maybe I need to, to get some help. So one of the ways that we can think about our, our mental health and seeing where we are on that continuum is to actually look at how are we doing today, right? Actually assess that, right? Because we, we don't intentionally do that very often. So I'm going to have you um, in a moment just turn to a partner. You're going to get to know your your partner very well today. Okay, you're going to do a number of activities with them. So you're going to turn to your partner and I want you to go through and answer these questions together for yourself, right? So like, how much sleep did you get last night, right? How, how much energy do you have? How stressed are you? And go through that uh, with your partner, okay? Go ahead, go for it. kind of never really get asked those questions. Yeah. It's like, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Like, pretty right. much every day. Right. Um, so it's like kind of like really diving into it, kind of seeing where you're at, all different aspects. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Getting a little more specific, right? Like that question of how are you doing? Well, there's a lot to that, right? Like all of these things go into how I'm doing, right? And so really diving into, well, how am I doing? Can I, how, how is my energy today? Like how much sleep did I get? You know, when I, when I do this for myself and I look back, I'm like, 
how much sleep did I get last night? And then I have to think about it, you know, I have to really feel like into how I'm feeling in that moment or, or that day, right? And so this sort of, these sort of questions then get at sort of this idea of where am I on the continuum? Depending on how I'm answering those questions, especially if I'm doing it on, on any kind of regular basis, then that allows me some insight into where I am, right? If I'm answering one, you know, some of these questions in the same way, like if I'm answering super stressed and I'm like, oh, all this week I've answered super stressed, maybe I should look at that. Maybe that means I might be in that more reacting part of the continuum, right? So this, these kind of, uh, the building this sort of self-awareness around mental health can help us determine where we are and then what we might need to do to help ourselves manage or cope with where we are. So once, once we kind of have an idea of where we are, um, when we're in this healthy and reacting, that's a lot of times where we can do um, some self-care, employ some coping mechanisms or some strategies, um, and do some self-care to get ourselves either from reacting back to healthy or, or just be able to manage what's happening in these two areas. It's also where we can employ some social support. In a moment, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about all those people that we can talk to um, for that social support, but where we can get some social support and really be able to, to manage what's happening there. Where, we, where I would recommend and where we would recommend seeking help is, is in, in the injured or ill category. So once you've sort of moved into that area, that's really when you might want to seek some professional, some professional care, which would likely be somewhere like the counseling center. Um, and it's just the same as if you, let's say, instead of just tweaking your hamstring, you pulled your hamstring, right? And you needed some help from the athletic trainer or physical therapist, some exercises, some ice, some management of it, right? You're going to go seek that help. So it's the same thing. If we've moved into that sort of realm of the continuum with mental health, that's when we might say, you know what, I need a little help to, to be able to understand how to manage this. And that might just be, really, how do I manage this, right? Getting some tips and, and some ideas of that, or it might just be talking to somebody. So I have athletes come in and talk to me, and, and sometimes it's just one session, and they're just like, I just need to get a whole bunch out. And then they feel a whole lot better, right? Or sometimes they might come two or three times, and that's all they need. Or I have athletes who come on a weekly basis, and so it really varies depending on what you need and who, you, uh, you know, who you're talking to and, um, and where you are along that continuum. But it's really being able to recognize, when am I in the, more of this phase where really I can't do this on my own? And I need to let somebody know that I'm not okay and that I need some help. And so when we do go to talk to someone, who, are we, who can we talk to? So in that sort of social support category, but even in that getting some help. So coaches, right, teammates friends, family, strength and conditioning coaches, athletic trainers, right? Even a professor who you might have a, a good relationship with might be someone that you could talk to. And then the counseling center, right? When, especially once we've gone into that sort of um, injured and, and ill category. And if you're not comfortable going to the counseling center right away, athletic trainer is, is, or a coach would be a great person to talk to in terms of how do you make that connection, right? Um, and so that way you can, you can get towards that that help that you might uh, might need. And so I, I really um, like to drive home that point that, that mental health is just like physical health, that sometimes we just need some help in managing it and getting past whatever it is that we're, um, that is challenging for us. And that it doesn't have to affect whether we're performing or not, right? It doesn't have to affect that. It only affects that if we're not managing or coping with it in the way that we need to. So what are some practical tips that just have to do with sort of like how do we take care of our mental health on a regular basis? So sleep is the very number one, really. How much sleep you get, the consistency of your sleep, and the quality of your sleep. One of the best things you can do for yourself is to set some sort of consistency around your sleep. And I know that's really hard for student athletes. Don't get me wrong. I know that that's really tough because your schedules vary and you have different homework some nights than other nights and practice and all of those things and oh, maybe a social life too, you know, all, all of that. So I know that there's a difficulty in consistency, but if you can find some way to be consistent, whether it's having a routine before bed that you do every night so that it starts to trigger to your brain, oh, it's bedtime, or um, a certain amount of sleep that you get every night, or, or even if you can just say in bed by this time, you know, that sort of thing, building some consistency around sleep. Um, getting rest that isn't sleep, right? Often we just think of rest and sleep as synonymous, um, but other times where we can rest that we're not doing something with our brain or trying to um, learn something or be on, right? That, that we're so on all the time. So how do we shut off that doesn't have to be sleep? 
um, nutrition, which you had a talk on, so I'm not going to belabor that point. Um, exercise, right, doing things that um, move our body or feel good to our body that's not even just related to our sport, but maybe like going and playing a different sport or going and exercising in some other way than just um, our sport. And journaling, so getting it out of here and onto the paper. So our brain processes things differently depending on how we're working with the information. So once we take it from here and we write it down, that means we have to process and work through that information. So often journaling can be a really great way to get some insight or to um, sort of put some things to bed or, or get it out of our brain um, and onto some paper. So I, I always recommend journaling. And then hobbies outside of sport, right? I know that we can all get very invested in like student athlete and that's what I do and sport is what I'm about. But having some things outside of our sport, too, can really help um, in that development of a whole person, um, which is helpful in, our, in taking care of our mental health. And remember that it's a process, right? That if you are moving down that continuum or fluctuating, right, it's a process. It's never going to be just a straight line. Just like sometimes when we're injured or we're sick or we have um, something that we have to take care of in the physical realm, it's never a straight line, right? We're always sort of coming up and down and fluctuating and turning all about. And so knowing that same thing with mental health, it's always a process and that it's not going to just, you know, fix like that. And we have to allow room and space for that. So what I want to talk about a little bit more now, which um, in sort of di more directly relates to our, uh, to, to performance and to competition and things like that, um, is how can we be more intentional about some of the things that we do to train our mind, right? So many of these things will help off the field in this mental health realm too, okay? But many of them we can use to enhance our performance on the field or, or just prepare better for competition. So if you think about it like mental conditioning, right? We do all sorts of physical conditioning. We run and we lift and we stretch and we do our skills. So we do all sorts of physical conditioning to prepare for sport. But we can also do all sorts of mental conditioning to prepare for sport. So ways to help us to focus better, to be more motivated, to know what we're shooting towards, um, to stay calm in the moment, to know how to manage those emotions, all of those things that are going on during our sport. We can do some, some skills, essentially, to train those so that we're better for competition. Okay? And there's skills like any of our physical skills, just like you wouldn't uh, go up and try a, a new swing or a new approach or a new shot in a game, right? Same thing. It's, it's physical. It's as physical skills, mental skills, are things to be practiced and trained. So, what are some of those uh, <coughs> mental skills that we're going to talk about? So, the first I want to talk about is motivation. Why do I call this a mental skill? Because often we think of motivation as like you have it or you don't, right? Like if you love something, you're going to be motivated to do it. But that's not always necessarily true, right? Like, you may love to play your sport, but there are going to be days that you don't feel like going to practice, right? I, I had the days when I didn't feel like going to practice. Raise your hand if you never felt like going to practice, or one time didn't feel like going to practice. I know there's coaches in the room, but it's okay. Guess what? They would raise their hand too. I promise, okay? There's days coaches don't feel like going to practice either, right? So we love, we can love it. It can be something that we're passionate about, but that doesn't mean that we always want to, we want to go 100%, right? And so motivation is something that we can work on, that we can um, keep ourselves working towards the goals that we've, we've set. So it's sort of like that um, dedication or that grit, like that staying with it, right? And so one of the ways that I work with athletes to develop motivation is to think about their why, right? Why do they play their sport? What is it that they love? What brings them back to practice every day? Right? What brings them to that competition each time? Why do they play their sport? And that's one of the things that can keep that purposeful, that motivation going. So what I want you to do is take a little bit of time to sort of think about and talk about what is your why, right? Why do you love your sport? What is it that you, what do you get from it, right? What brings you back each day? So again, with your partner, have a little discussion of your why.
right, so let's come back together. Um, all right, so what were some of your whys? Give me, give me a couple examples. Why you play your sport? What we'll brings you back? Keeps you coming back? Yeah. Do help the people. Good people. Yeah, absolutely. Right, the people you get to play with. Yeah. Um, I have very similar um, routines. Okay. Uh, and so um, it's also just like having two hours out of your day that you can have fun with the people that you love and also the sport that you love. So awesome. Okay. Awesome. Good. So I'm gonna look forward to each day. That, that two hours. That two hours. Yeah. Anybody else? What's one of your? What's another why? Another reason you go play? Yeah. I think a big part of it is for me at least is just seeing a bunch of hard work pay off. Yeah. And that feeling of like I put so much effort into this and you know yeah. I got a lot out of it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. Just the challenge of it. Yeah. Yeah, so feeling that challenge each time you go. Yep, awesome, right? And so what I often um, encourage athletes to do is put these things on, on like a three by five card or a piece of paper, somewhere where you can see it, right? On a regular basis, like in your room, put, or, or put a piece of paper even in your bag that you bring with you every day, right? So that you can see that and you can revisit that. So on those days when you don't feel like going to practice, you can be like, okay, wait, what's my why? And like. If that's all I get out of practice today, or that's the thing that like keeps me going during practice, then that's it, right? Like, hey, get to have some fun with my with my friends on the team, and this is like that two hours. So I'm gonna, you know what? I'm just gonna focus on practice on that today, right? Or I'm gonna, there's something I'm gonna challenge myself to do today at practice, and if I hit that challenge, that's something I love about it. That's what's gonna keep me at practice today. So keeping that why right at that forefront helps us keep motivated and helps us find something that we can get out of every time that we step on the field. The other part of motivation um, or that we can use to motivate us is goal setting, right? And setting goals really intentionally. Often we kind of like, we'll set goals and we have these goals, but we don't really um, maybe have them written down or as um, set as smartly as we could, right? And so there's different types of goals, and, and whenever I work with teams or athletes, it's always something that I focus on, because I think it's good for us to have a vision. Where do we want to get to, right? What are we doing this for? And then how do we get there? So we can set outcome goals, we can set performance goals, and we can set process goals. Now, outcome goals are those like vision, bigger picture goals. So that might be like at the end of the season, where do we want to be? So I was just setting goals with a lacrosse team that I work with, and we sort of looked at, okay, where do we want to be at the end of the season? Um, and so we set those outcome goals. An example of one of those was they wanted to have a, um, a winning record at home, because we really wanted to focus on being better at home. Um, and they also wanted to be, um, they wanted to make the playoffs and with home field advantage. So last year our goal was with the same team was to make the playoffs, right? And they did that. And so they said this year we want to keep like somewhat consistent, but we want to push ourselves just a little further, right? So we want to, that's where we want to be. And that really just means they have to flip flop and be fourth instead of fifth this, this season, right? So we set those outcome goals. Now, the only problem with outcome goals is that we actually have very little control over them. We think that we have a lot of control over them, but we have very little control over them. Because we could have the best season that we've ever had. They could play the best lacrosse they've ever played. And other teams could still be better, right? Or things could be weird in the conference and people could beat people they shouldn't have beaten and all these things could happen, right? So we still couldn't get there even though we played the best lacrosse that we played. So outcomes are really great for that sort of like vision and motivation. Like what are we trying to achieve? And at the end of the year we can look back and see if we did that. What we want to focus on a more regular basis is on performance and process goals, things that are more under our control. So performance goals are those sort of, um, what kind of targets do we want to be hitting on, on a regular basis? Like what do we want our, our, um, our fielding percentage to be over the course of the season? What do we want our batting average to look like? What do we want our shooting percentage to look like? Things like that, okay? Um, and we can be constantly sort of looking at, are we hitting that, right? Like halfway through the season, I can look, where's our shooting percentage? Is it close to where we want to be? then what might we need to adapt if not, right? Um, and so those performance goals that we have a little more control over as a team, um, and even individually, right? You can have a little more control over those. And then what we focus on on a regular basis, on like an everyday basis, is our process goals. So those are the steps that we would take to reach those performance goals. And then hopefully we've set our performance goals well enough that we get to the outcome goal, right? So we don't really actually have to think about reaching that outcome goal. 
You just have to think about those performance and process. And process might be how much we shoot during the week, or um, how much we run, or um, you know, how many reps of, of certain drill or certain things that we do. Or we're going to talk about some of the mental skills, right? How much I practice my mental skills over the course of a week. And we want to set those goals in a smart way, meaning we want them to be specific. So often people will say, like, well, I want to improve my stick skills, or I want to, I want to, get, I want to be a better hitter. Well, those are really broad, right? Like to be a better hitter, a lot goes into that. There's a lot that goes into hitting. Same with stick skills. There's a lot that goes into that, right? So we want to be more specific. What is it that we need to improve in those areas, right? Is it hitting the curveball or is it, you know, um, catching with my left hand or whatever the case might be? I know there's a softball and lacrosse are the examples I have right next to the two teams that I'm working with the most right now, so they're <laughs> right in my frame of reference. Um, so. So where, what are those sort of um, specific things that we want to work on? And then are they measurable, right? Like, wh how would I know that I've reached them? How would I know that I did them if, I can't, if they're not measurable? So that might be a time that I need to put on it or a percentage or a weight. If I'm in the weight room and I want to, I want to be able to bench press a certain amount, right, then I can measure that because can I do it or not, right? So we want to make them measurable. So we want to stay away from words like better or improve because they don't really tell us what does better mean, right? If I'm better by a percentage point, is that what I mean? How, how do I get better? And then achievable, meaning are they under our control to achieve? So we want to stay away from like comparative goals, right? When we compare against somebody else, again, we can't control their performance. So we could literally have the best performance of our life, never run faster than we ran that day, and someone could still run faster than us, right? So we want to make sure that our goals are under our control, achievable. Realistic. We don't want them so challenging that we get you know, discouraged or so easy that we get bored. So we want to hit that sweet spot of realistic. And then timely, right? Do we set a time frame for them? Is it in the next month, two months, three months, the next year? What's the time frame? So to get a little practice in goal setting, you're going to work with your partner. And I want you to think about what's one thing that you could achieve today and set it in a smart way. Okay, so what's one goal, what's one thing that you could do today um, towards, you know, whatever a, a bigger goal that you have in life is, um, and, and that you could achieve today, and I want you to set it in a smart way. So go ahead. So you want to stay positive and cheer on. So like, um, what would cheer on? What, be more specific. Um, like on the last one, super hard. Just um, refrain from the urge to like sit down immediately after I'm done. And just okay. stay up and like cheer for my teammates who are still running. Okay. And um, say something like, oh, one left, you got this. Okay. All right. Good. So very specific, right? Is that measurable? Yeah. 
I guess you would know whether you did it at the end or not, right? Maybe even, yeah, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, is it achievable, is it under your control? Yeah. yeah. Realistic? Yeah. Yeah, feels like relatively challenging, but, but not too easy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Timely? Today? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good, right? So pretty smart goal, right? But what's that showing too is that we can do this anytime, right? We don't have to set um, long-term goals or, or these lofty things, all be, you know, only doing that, right? These bigger goals. But instead, we can be setting goals for ourselves all the time and thinking, is that reasonable? Is it realistic? Is it achievable? Um, can I measure it at the end of the day? Um, and a great strategy for using them is for practice, right? Like I said, that motivation to practice. Set a goal for each practice. Right? And then, hey, even if you just achieve that one thing, well, then that's pretty good, right? Because sometimes I walk away from practice and I'm like, wait, what did I do that practice? Right? And then at least you know one thing that you achieved um, at that practice and can keep you motivated and focused. Okay? So using goal setting, not just in that bigger, bigger sense, but also just on a regular basis. And then imagery. So mental rehearsal. Okay? Visualization sometimes this is referred to as. And so this is really the idea of rehearsing um, mentally what we either want to do or have just done, right? So um, sometimes, or a lot of times, we think of it just as like before we do something we want to mentally rehearse, but we can also mentally rehearse after. Like if you just made a great play and then you're, you're like in the dugout or you're on the bench afterwards or, or there's a break in play, see it back again, right? Like watch yourself do it again because you just did it and then you can train your brain to say like, hey, that was a good thing, right? Play it right back. So we can use it both after and before. So we can use it before to prime ourselves on what we want to do, what we want to achieve, right? What is the motion that we want to make? What's the skill we want to do? So we can prime ourselves in that way. To, once we've seen ourselves do it, we're more likely to believe that we can do it. We can also use it for things like skill correction, skill execution, going through something. So a lot of performers use imagery, particularly when it's a skill that you can't practice a million times. Right? So things like um, gymnastic routines or uh, the, the ski jumping, right? Have you seen those, the ski jumps where it's like that huge steep hill and they come up and they do like flips in the air and then land? Amazing, amazing. They can't physically do that as many times as they would need to do to practice it, to, to get it right, right? So they use imagery all the time to practice their movement. They go all the way through from imagining themselves on top Right, to what it will feel like, what they need to be looking at and seeing out in their, in their world, what their body needs to feel like as they go down that hill, as they do the flips and land. They practice it in their mind over and over again. It's like mental reps. Right? And what we know um, from research and from science is that what's, what's really cool is that when we really vividly imagine something, it actually innervates the muscles that would be necessary in that movement. So in a lot of ways, you really are actually mentally, you're doing a mental rep. Right? You're priming your body for this, for this movement uh, pattern. Okay? So imagery can be really powerful both in, and in a lot of different ways, like I said, like before, after, all sorts of things. It's also really good for confidence. Right? Seeing ourselves do it makes us feel like we can do it. Right? So uh, let's have a little experience of this. So I'd like you to close your eyes. I know that's dangerous because we've just eaten lunch and it's warm in here, but stay with me. And so I want you to allow an image or a picture of when you performed at your best start to come to mind. And it might be yesterday, it might be 10 years ago. Whatever image comes to your mind of when you performed at your best, meaning a performance where you felt like nothing could go wrong, you could do everything right, it just felt really natural and fluid. Felt like you were just flowing and the movement was just happening. See if you can find just such a moment and allow it to just keep replaying in your mind. As you do, see if you can start to let some of those details come into focus. So who was there with you? Where were you? What was it that you were doing? What did it feel like emotionally? What did it feel like physically? What did it look like? Maybe even what did it smell <coughs> like or taste like? Bring all of those senses into the picture. Allowing yourself to fully engage with that 
best performance. Allow yourself to feel what it felt like. What was that like? What did you notice? For some of you, it might have been easier. For some of you, it might have been more challenging. Anybody want to give a reflection? Yeah. For me, it was harder to remember who exactly was around. Mm -hmm. um, I remember like maybe a few people, but like I don't remember sounds or anything. Yeah. Um, but I do remember like the feeling of it. Yeah, like what it felt like. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Anybody else? So imagery is a skill like any other, right? It, has to, it needs to be practiced. Um, so that's why some of you may have found that easier or more challenging um, because it, it really is something that we need to get used to doing. And there's a lot that you can do in terms of imagery skill development. So a lot of times we think about vividness, like how, how clear was the picture, right? Could you really see the details? Um, and then the other half of that is controllability. Like, can, can you make the image do what you want it to do? So if you're trying to correct a skill, right, you want to see yourself doing it correctly, but if you just keep seeing yourself doing it incorrectly, that's not really helpful, right? So how much can we control that image so that it, it does what we want it to do? Okay, so imagery, like, like any of these mental skills, really is about practicing um, and getting a little bit more proficient at it. Um, but there's many ways that you can practice, and a lot of times it's just from doing it. Um, and sort of even in just in that context of kind of a best performance, like what can I just see myself performing and things like that, okay? So another one is breathing, right? So being able to, um, so our, our physiological arousal is like in, intricately, intricately linked to our breathing, right? So how high we are, how low we are. So like if we're calm, our breathing is, is likely to be more shallow, um, more rhythmic, right, versus when we're up here and excited and, and maybe a little too um, excited, too nervous, right? Our breathing rate is real quick um, and much more shallow. Did I say shallow for common and deep? Um, so shallow for, for um, when we're too high, right? And we know that sometimes we can't perform when we're too much up there, right? We're, too, we're, we're nervous and we're not able to kind of, um, m you know, manage that or function with that, right? So the breath is a great way um, to help us kind of influence that um, up or down, okay? And so we can go to the breath. And so a really good, uh, easy pattern to remember is four in, four out, two pause, right? So let's try that real quick, okay? So if we inhale, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, pause. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, pause. Right? So I know it's the first time you did it, but you might have noticed, right, that you just you come down a little bit, right? And we may, might then be able to think a little clearer or, or feel a little more in control of what's going on for us. So in any time when you have that big moment or that thing going on, a meeting or a conversation or a play or you're in the midst of competition, right, we can just go to the breath. All right, so even before this, right, when I was preparing for the presentation, I'm like, whew, okay. Go to the breath, right? Allow that breath to help us come back to the moment, back to sort of that calm, still where we feel like we can focus a little better and feel a little more in control of what's going on in our body. So another is self-talk. So when we talk about self-talk, when we talk about like positive versus negative thinking, we're really not thinking about it as positive or negative. I want you to think about it more as like adaptive, useful, effective thinking, right? Like what's helpful rather than just what's positive or negative. So a couple of keys here. One is that our brain doesn't really uh, respond to don't, right? Like when we say don't do something, our brain is really thinking about the something, right? So if you've ever had that experience where you're like walking upstairs and there's like people like at graduation or something, right? And you're like, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip. And then you trip because your brain is only hearing trip, 
right? It's the object. So if you're like, don't swing at the high one, don't swing at the high one, and then you swing at the high one. Because all you're thinking about is swinging at the high one, right? You're not telling your brain what to do instead. So our brain doesn't really hear don't very well. Um, the other part of that is that we're, we are um, basically, you know, kind of trained or um, made to think of the negative, to remember the negative, to remember what's going wrong. And that's a basic survival mechanism from way, way, way back when, when we were predator and prey, and we had to remember where the lion and tiger was so that we didn't get eaten. Okay? We had to remember those, those places to stay away from and what went wrong that last time. Unfortunately, it's stuck with us, even though we don't need it in that capacity. So we're very good at noticing the negative. We're very good at noticing what's going wrong. And what we want to do is start to try and train our brain towards noticing what's going right. Right? What is, what's right in this scenario? What's, what's going well? What, it, what are some of those positive things that have happened? Okay? So we, but we have to train our brain to do that because we're so trained not to. So um, with your partner, in a moment, you're going to have 30 seconds. And well, you're each going to have 30 seconds. And your partner's going to go for 30 seconds. And then you're going to go for 30 seconds. I'll yell switch in the middle. Um, and you're going to talk about something positive or something that went really well in the last 24 hours for you. Just one thing. And I want you to, to describe it all the way. What did it feel like? Who was there? What was happening? What did you do? All of those sorts of things. Okay. So I want you to really describe the whole thing. All right? Okay, so get with your partner, decide who's going to go first, and go for it. Experience like what was that like? Yeah. You got to re-trigger positive emotions. Yeah, yeah. You got to feel it all over again, right? Yep. What else? Yeah. I felt like recounting it, like further emphasize, like oh, that's something you should do again or try again. Yeah, yeah. So it gave you feedback, right? Yeah. On it. Yeah. Um, I think. If you had a bad day yesterday, yeah. it shows you how easily your brain just jumps to the negatives and like yeah. you may even have a hard time thinking of something positive. Right. right. Yeah. But there's probably something in every day, right? Like the day can't be all bad, right? And so this when when we try and recount what happened positive, it starts to train our brain to remembering those things, right, and defining them. So I'll often encourage athletes, like, okay, hey, at the end of each day, I, w I want you to, for two or three weeks, I want you to intentionally write down, like, two or three things that went really well that day, right? And what starts to happen is that after a week or so, during the day, you then start to notice what was going well because you're like, oh, I need to remember that for later so that I can write it down. So then your brain starts actively, even during the day, starting to notice those things that are going well and start to, to um, keep track of them so that you can write them down, right? But what we're doing really is starting to just shift our focus, shift our lens into seeing what's going well because we're so good at seeing what's not going well. We don't need to practice that, right? But we need to practice seeing what's going well. Um, and so some of that adaptive thinking, like I was saying, is right. it's focusing on the solution. And that doesn't mean that we can't recognize what the problem is, but we spend an awful time, a lot of time on the problem. What, what is it that we could do about the problem? What's some of that solution? What's some of the things or the reasons why we'll succeed, right? We can think of all the reasons why we won't. Well, why will we, right? What, what, can, what are we going to bring to the table that's going to allow us to succeed? What do we have? What can we gain? 
rather than what we could lose, right? Sometimes we go into games thinking, oh, we could lose or this could happen, right? Well, what could we gain, right? What could we get from this experience? Even if we do lose, right? What are we gonna gain from having had this experience, from having had this game and this challenge? So focusing on what we wanna do. And like I said, even with that, that don't, right? Our brain really doesn't hear that. So instead of going up to the plate and thinking, don't, you know, don't swing at the, the high one, what, do I, what am I looking for instead? Maybe I'm looking for that low outside. So I want, instead I'm saying, look for that low outside, right? So I'm instructing my brain towards what I want it to do, what I want to have happen, rather than what I don't. And so finally is mindfulness. And so um, when I'm thinking about mindfulness, right, we're really thinking about um, how do we get to the here and now, right? Like how do we get to the moment? Um, and in sport, this is really important because in sport, the moment is the only thing we can do anything about, right? Like right now, the pitch that's coming to me or the, the ball that's been hit to me or the shot that I need to take right now, right? That's, that's what's right in front of me. Whatever just happened, I can't do anything about now. And I can't determine what's going to happen in 20 seconds. I only have control over what's right now. And so mindfulness helps us come back to that moment a little bit. And some of that is just in noticing when we're not in the moment, right? Noticing when we're like way in the future or when we're back in the past and, and asking ourselves, hey, can I come back to this moment just right now, right? And knowing that our mind's gonna wander again because that's what minds do. Our attention span is all of about six seconds before we have to decide to refocus on something. So our mind is gonna wander. It's not about beating ourselves up for our mind wandering, but just noticing, right? Like, hey, I'm not here right now. I just started thinking about this other thing that I have to do in 20 minutes when I leave here. Wait, can I be here for just the next 20 minutes, right? Because that's where I am, and that's what's, what I'm doing right now. Um, and the other part of that is accepting that experience, right? Accepting whatever the moment is giving us. So often, we're trying to kind of like ignore or push down or like avoid the stuff we don't want and try and like hold on to all that stuff we do. But what happens there is that half the time then when we're in the thing that's going right, we're just trying to make sure that it doesn't end, right? We're not even really in the thing that's, that's going right because we're just waiting for it to, the shoe to drop or for it to not be right anymore. And then when we're in the thing that's like not great, the whole time we're just thinking about ways that we can avoid it or, or it not happen. But think about that two-year-old, right, who comes up and is like, hey, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. Ever had a two-year-old do that to you, right? And then you're like, What's up? And they're like, ah, nothing. And they run away. <laughs> right? And it, happens, it happens. Our emotions and our thoughts and a lot of times those, those experiences that we don't like, they're the same way. If we don't give them a little bit of an attention in space, they just hang out. And they're just like, hey, no, 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 I'm here. I'm here. Pay attention. Right? So mindfulness allows us to hopefully take in that experience and accept it a little more. And what we're trying to do ultimately with mindfulness is create a little bit of space so that we can respond to what's happening instead of react. We're like always just reacting, right? So um, you all have that annoying friend or annoying person in your life? Yeah, right? That person is just like is annoying, right? Most of us have that person. And they walk into the room and like you're annoyed, like immediately, right? And you're like, oh, I'm so annoyed. And they haven't done anything yet, <laughs> literally nothing. They've just walked into the room, right? But like we don't really like to feel annoyed. I and mean, maybe we could give them a chance. Right? But we don't even allow the space for that. Right? So maybe with mindfulness, we can allow a little bit more space. And then the same applies for sport. Right? Like the ref makes a call, and we're like immediately, you know, we react to that, to that call rather than to, okay, wait, how can I, can I like pause for a second? What can I, how can I respond to this situation? They already made the call. There's nothing I can do about it. So how can I respond instead? And so mindfulness kind of helps us bridge some of that gap. So, um, so we're going to do a quick mindfulness, a uh, little mindfulness exercise. Anybody done any mindfulness meditation? A little bit? Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so um, what I'm going to have you do is sit back in your chair and um, hands on the knees or like in the lap, okay? And um, I know you have the backs to your chairs, but pretend like that back wasn't there and hold yourself up, okay? So that kind of keeps you um, energized and engaged, all right? And in a moment, what I'm going to have you do is count your breaths up to 10 and then back down to zero. Okay? Um, and now, when, as, you're, as you're counting, don't worry about how your breath is coming to you. Just let it come to you however it wants to. 
We all breathe at different rates. So when you get back to zero, you'll just open your eyes. And if other people aren't, their eyes aren't open yet, that's fine. Okay. Um, and so you'll count up to 10 and then back down to zero. Um, and the key here is really that we're just noticing when our mind's not here. So if your mind wanders to like what's happening later or what's already happened, you'll just say, hey, mind, come on back to the breath, right? No judgment about it. Actually, congratulate yourself because you noticed, right? That's the first step. Bring it on back, and that's really all we're going to be doing the whole time, okay? Is just counting our breath, noticing when we're away, and coming on back, okay? And if you lose count, you don't have to start at zero. Just start back up wherever you are, all right? So if you close your eyes, and just for the first moment, just notice that you are here right now. You are sitting in this room. We're all together. This is where your body is right now. And so can you bring your mind to your body where it is right now? Can you give yourself the space and just allow yourself to be just right here, right now? Nothing else to do, just breathing. And so as you notice that breath, noticing how it comes to you, you can begin to start counting that breath. So each breath in and then out is one. Remember, you'll count to 10 and then come back down to zero. Just allowing the breath to come to you however it pleases. And then just simply counting it and allowing the next breath to come. And remember when your mind wanders, which it will, because that's what minds do, you'll just notice it. You'll congratulate yourself for noticing, and then you'll come back to the breath. When you get to 10, if you haven't already, you'll just come back down to zero. Most people's eyes are open. Okay, so um, with mindfulness, like I said, we're really just trying to train our brain to come back to the moment and to accept what's in that moment and have some space for it. So in, in sports, that's where it's relevant because your body is here and we need our mind to be where our body is. To be able to perform at our best, we need our mind to be where our body is. And that's where mindfulness can really help. So. That is what I have for you. And the key takeaway is just that we can be more intentional in training our mind. And not only is that going to help us on the field, in competition, in practice, but it's also going to help us in life. It's going to help us in that mental health aspect of taking care of our mind just as we take care of our body. All right? Thanks very much.